in our previous house, when the neighbor moved in across the street, I was out talking to them right after, right after they moved in. And she was, uh, uh, she was a hilarious person. She has a great sense of humor. But she was saying, man, my garage is so cluttered. And it was kind of funny to me because she has not seen a cluttered garage yet. <laughs> Her garage is so cluttered, she said, it makes me feel a little dead inside. And she was serious. It was so hilarious to me. I, wow, that would make you feel dead inside? And so they went, they rented a storage unit and moved all the stuff out of their garage so that it could be clean and then just move it, things in at a nice leisurely pace. I, I love that. It's, it's just always uh, it just stuck, stuck with me that it made her feel dead inside. Okay, I think she might have been kidding just a little bit. But you know what? To, to, uh, seriously, spiritually speaking, we're all born dead inside, spiritually. Spiritually speaking, we're all sinners by nature. And unfortunately, sin leads to death. So if, if we live our lives kind of running the other way away from God, if we live independently from God, then at the end of life, when we die, we will spend eternity separate from God as a result of our sin. If you make uh, or I make selfish choices in our relationships, that, that, that selfishness, that sin of selfishness is going to lead to death of some type in that relationship. Sin leads to death. That is just a universal principle that God has put into the, um, into the world since the fall of humanity. So I got good news, though. I've got good news. You can find real hope and renewed life in Jesus. You don't have to go down the path of sin and death. You can go down the path of hope and life. In fact, you went in the driveway of Hope and Life today, and you came here to Hope and Life. That's so awesome. I love it. If you have a Bible, would you turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 2? And if you have a Bible on your a device, I encourage you to get it out and get God's Word in your hand so you can see what comes before and after it. You can reread the verse if I move on too quickly. Colossians 2, verses 11 to 14. And if you're, if you're uh, reading Bible on a device then you could probably choose what translation. Choose the NLT. That's what we, are, we generally read from in, when we gather on Sundays. So we're in a, in a series called Renew. And it's about realizing that you are raised to new life in Christ and living that way. Today I want to talk to you about fully alive. Fully alive. So how would you like to go from feeling a little dead inside to feeling fully alive. I'm, I'm in on that one. Yes, absolutely. How would you like to live life to the fullest? We're going to talk about that today, so stay tuned. You can find real hope and renewed life in a moment. When you put your faith in Jesus, all of a sudden, his hope and his life comes into you, and it's, it's in a moment. But Real hope and renewed life also are to be cultivated and developed and embraced over your whole lifetime. It's a lifelong process. And I talked about that last week, how even salvation is punctiliar and progressive. That's what I talked about last week. Punctiliar just means salvation happens at a point in time, at a point. That's where that punctiliar is. The root is point in there, and it's also progressive. It's a process. It, it takes time, and we're always growing. So I hope that every single one of us, myself included, are growing in hope in Jesus, not just in the feeling like the mushy feeling of hope, but hope in a person, Jesus Christ, the living God. And I hope that you are finding real hope in him, regardless of your circumstances, and that you are being renewed. I have been following Jesus for many decades. And still, I need renewed life in Jesus. Still. As old habits, you know, slowly drop away. As new habits come on, uh, I need to be renewed. My mouth needs to continually be renewed in Jesus. I need to have, I, I, I want to speak life. It's one of our core values of our church. And so I need to be renewed. We all need renewed life in Jesus. 
it's 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 really cool that because we're it, it is a process it is a journey we are all on this journey together so because of that we know that none of us has arrived amen like none of us is perfect even the apostle paul who wrote a good chunk of the new testament said i do not brag about anything i got going on because i'm still in process uh, he, he said, I don't even say that I, I've even attained all this that we're, that we're um, uh, uh, trying, to, trying to, to achieve in Jesus. He says, but I just keep pressing on toward the goal. Even the Apostle Paul said, I'm on a journey. And so we know in our congregation, we're on a journey. So we cut each other slack, amen? And I don't know about you, but I, I, I think that uh, it's coming up in Colossians 3 here pretty soon that there's actually a verse that says something like, and we cut each other slack. It's something like, we make allowance for each other's faults. But many times in my life, uh, I, 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 I quote that verse inside my mind when I start to get a little mm, with somebody. I just remember, oh, yes, I'm on a journey, too, so I'm going to make allowance for their faults in the same way I want to be made allowance for my faults. And that's really cool that we're the church. We're in it together. We know nobody's perfect. We know we're following Jesus best we can. And it's really interesting how Jesus puts his finger and the Holy Spirit brings conviction about certain things in our lives. And when he does that in someone else's life, it's rarely in the order you would choose. Like we tend to go, let's go after the big ones right now. Let's get those dealt with. And God does not always do that. God is bringing a person along and he says, I, I see the log. I see the log in the right. But let's just, let's work on the spec. Let, let's just, sometimes God just goes that way. We're all on a journey. We're all uh, growing in real hope and renewed life. And we want to live life to the fullest. Okay, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 says, When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Okay, whoa. <laughs> wow, that, that just came out of nowhere. You weren't expecting that verse, were you? When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, in quotes, but not by a physical procedure. So let me just give you a teeny bit of background about this. Centuries ago, God appeared to a man named Abraham, and he said, Abraham, I got something big I want to do through you and through your family. This man had no kids, and he was very old already. And God said, I am going to make a promise to you, Abraham. I am going to bless the whole world through you. And we know, spoiler alert, God did that because Jesus himself was born into Abraham's family. His great, 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 great grandson was, was Jesus. And through Jesus, God did bless the whole world. So God kept his promise to Abraham. But God said, now, Abraham, you might want to sit down for this because there's something I need you to do. You and all the males in your household, all the servants, all the everybody, I need you to be circumcised. It's such a strange thing. But God required it. And so many times when God does something in the physical realm, he is trying to teach us something about the spiritual realm. And it turns out that circumcision was a physical illustration of a spiritual principle. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But that's, that's a little bit of context for what, 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 how did we get to Colossians 2.11 talking about circumcision. I'm going to go on in that same verse. Christ, uh, Christ Jesus performed a spiritual circumcision. That is, the cutting away of your sinful nature. So as I mentioned earlier, the consequences of sin is death. And God does not want you or I to die. He doesn't want us to have to face those consequences. But those are the consequences for sin. So Jesus had to enter death to deal with the root cause of sin. Jesus himself died. He came, took on the form of humanity, lived a sinless life, and he died. Jesus died on the cross for your sinful nature and my sinful nature, for your sinful choices, my sinful choices, and he was buried. So 
Jesus is doing this amazing spiritual work. And look at what circumcision is tied to. Colossians 2.12. For you were buried with Christ. So he just said, Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. Verse 12. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. So somehow, circumcision relates to being buried with Christ in baptism, in water baptism. It goes on to say, and with Jesus, with him, you were raised to new life. So you were buried with Christ, you were raised to new life because you trusted, in other words, you put your faith in the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. This is a very, uh, just a, a beautifully written passage uh, of, of the Bible that tells us some of the most amazing things that God did for you and for me. Uh, you and I are called to enter into Jesus' death through baptism so that through this co-death, sin and death may be undone in our lives by a co-resurrection. So Paul said in the verse I just read, in verse, uh, verse 12, you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. You entered into, you participated in his death. And it's, it's shown, it's demonstrated physically as we put the person down into the water, we are burying them with Christ. And we are burying their old nature. Not just simply a cute illustration, but somehow a very tangible, physical thing, that, uh, a, a, a process that, that was important enough to God that he said, I'm, uh, Jesus said, I'm making it a command. Go and tell everyone in the world about me and baptize them. When they put their faith in me, baptize them. It's, this is a super, super important, tangible, experiential thing that God has asked us to do. So when we put a person down in the baptism tank under the water, we say, buried with Christ. And then we raise them up and we say, raised to new life. Buried with Christ, raised to new life. So somehow, in God's eyes, we are participating with Jesus in his death and resurrection. Our old sinful nature that we were all born with, myself also, yo también, we all were born with that sinful nature, and we're just, we are actually, through the, the work that Jesus did on the cross, we are saying, I'm participating in that. I am, I'm following you, Jesus. I'm applying that work on the cross to my life, and I am leaving my old person in the water, my old sinful nature, and I am raised to new life with Christ, as God's word says, Colossians 2.12. So um, baptism in water is more than just an illustration. It is a command of God. It is a command of Jesus to us. It is an experiential thing where for a moment, we're not breathing. You know how it is. I mean, like five seconds under the water, you hold your breath, and it reminds us, wow, Jesus actually died for me. And it's a very powerful thing that we get to participate with him. It's just a moment in time you participate with his death and then a resurrection. Verse 13, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Do you see the allusion to circumcision there? Then God made you alive with Christ. Hallelujah. And probably the most popular benefit of, of uh, the gospel, of, of the work that Jesus did, is the forgiveness of sins. It's the one we talk about every single Sunday. And it sounds like sin must be the fundamental problem, and it is. But many times in the New Testament, we see that death is presented as a fundamental problem also. Death is a problem. It is not God's plan. He doesn't want us to die. Death entered humanity when we chose to sin. And from that very moment, we, our, our relationship with God began to die. Our, something in our relationship with each other began to die. Death is the result of sin. Sin leads to death. So life is the solution 
Praise God Almighty. Life is the solution. So let's see what Jesus did to make you alive with Christ. We just read Colossians 2.13. You were dead because of your sins, because your sinful nature was not yet cut away before you put your faith in Jesus. Then God made you alive with Christ. Going on in that same verse. For he forgave all our sins. Somebody say all. All. Oh, wow. That's how many of our sins Jesus forgave. And here, there, are, there are, are, are different root words that are sometimes translated sin in the Bible. And uh, this one in particular uh, describes a violation of God's will that leads to separation from God. So there's, there are other, uh, uh, the other root words to talk about different aspects of sin. But here, when it says he forgave all our sin, he forgave all. All our violations of God's perfect law. Every little or big thing that we did, which was not something God uh, wanted for us, he forgave those sins. Forgiveness here is, is God's grace to love you. His grace and love that reaches out to rescue you and sets you free from slavery to sin. That's what we're talking about here. He forgave. He did that. He rescued you. He was reaching out to you saying, put your faith in Jesus. I want to rescue you and deliver you from slavery to sin. Man, that's a good thing. Verse 14. He, so we're still, still talking about Jesus he, uh, and, and uh, what, what God the Father did through Jesus. He canceled the record of the charges against us. Because we are all born in sin, it's, it's as if we had already broken the law uh, the moment we were born, and, and there were charges by the, by the prosecutor brought against us. And I love what author Scott McKnight wrote, that this record of the charges, uh, is, it comes from a root word that talks about a handwritten certificate of indebtedness, sort of like uh, an IOU that when when you owe someone to some uh, to someone and you can't pay you sign a thing that says I can't pay but I acknowledge that I do owe you this this uh, this thing this debt right now and so when he when he said he canceled the record of the charges against us he canceled that piece of paper that certificate that says you owe me because of all these charges against you. Sort of like when you, uh, when you speed and get caught, then all of a sudden you now have a debt to the court system, to the, uh, to the police, whoever, whoever it is that gave you the ticket. You now have a debt. You owe them for your infraction, for your violation. And, and God's word says there was a record of the violations that every human has done uh, in, in violating God's law. So one big source of those is actually the law of Moses, which we see in the, in the early part of the Bible. And God shows that, what he, he, that he is perfect, he is holy, and that's actually what he expects of his creation. And so there's all these hundreds of commands where God says, you've got to treat people this way, you've got to abstain from this kind of food, abstain from this kind of relationship. And he, he, he spells it all out there. And it's a, because we, none of us, have obeyed all that, that now becomes a record of, our charge, of the charges against us. You didn't do this. You did that. You didn't do this. You did do that. And the, the, the amazing thing is that God's people, the Jews, they could not live up to that. And so that record of the laws, just, uh, it just pointed out all their sins. And for all of us, who are not even Jewish, we were outside of God's plan at that time, the law simply said, and you are shut out of God's plan and of God's purposes in the earth. But Jesus, but Jesus canceled that record of wrongs against you. He canceled it, and it, it is not there anymore because he paid that debt. He paid the debt of our sin, sort of like if you, if you commit a traffic violation and you have to pay, you owe something for your violation. Jesus took all of the violations and said, of everyone who ever lived on the planet, 
I paid for that. I paid your debt. He canceled it. And then going on in the same verse, uh, where in Colossians 2.14, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Now, this is amazing. Jesus laid down his life, and they, they put him on a, a Roman cross of execution. And Pilate, the governor, said, write a sign and, and hang it. I always, I always pictured it above his head. I don't know, I don't know how it was hanging. But it's hanging on the cross. And it said what his horrible crime was. The reason he was being executed. The sign just said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This is not a crime. So in other words, he's hanging there, being executed, but there is no crime. He, he is not hanging there for his own crime. So what Jesus did is he said, I'm going to put a different sign up here. Put the sign up on this cross that I'm hanging on. Sinner. Is that an appropriate title for Jesus, the sinless son of God? No. Who's that? Whose title is that? Ours. So Jesus took our charges. Isaiah 53 says, The Lord laid on him the sin of us all, the iniquity of us all. So Jesus hung there on that cross. He was innocent. And he took our sins and paid for them. So the innocent one died for the, for the guilty ones who should have died so that the guilty ones could become the innocent ones. Wow! That is what God did for us through Jesus on the cross. And I believe that the good news is, and I'm hoping I'm demonstrating this by what we just read, the good news is that God wants to make you fully alive. He wants it bad. <laughs> he wants it very bad. He does not want you dead in your sins. That is not how he wants it. He doesn't want you separated from him for eternity after you die. That is not his plan. Hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. It is not prepared for you and me. You don't have to go there. I don't have to go there. But many people choose to go there because that is where sin sends you. But I'm here today to tell you, don't go there. That's not, that is not the plan. Let, let's make sure that we're all going to heaven. All right? Does that sound good? You're with me on that? That sounds like a much better place to spend eternity. This is what God wants. Jesus said in John 10.10, John 10, I have come that they may have a rich and satisfying, abundant, thriving life. That's what God wants for you, renewed life. That, that is his will for your life. In uh, Jeremiah 29, God says that he has got great plans for his people, and we are now included in his people because we have put our faith in Jesus. He says, my plans for you are not to harm you. They're not to take you down. They're not to beat you down. They're not to punish you. My plans for you are good plans to give you a hope and a future, a real hope <laughs> and a renewed life. To live, uh, and he goes on to say that when you seek me, you will find me. God's plan for you is to have his presence in your life. Wow. And with his presence comes fullness of joy and peace and all the things that we want. Even though sometimes our lives are hard, God's presence is sweet. It is the most amazing thing, and I've seen it over and over again. So we were spiritually dead, but God offers you life, punctiliar and progressive life in a moment and in your lifetime and even beyond your lifetime. So why don't we just live fully alive? That's what God wants. Why, why don't we cooperate? <laughs> why, why does our relationship with God sometimes seems boring? That does not sound like a rich and satisfying life. That, God does not want your relationship with him to be boring. But, you know, so many times people will pray like in church or with a friend or, 
uh, while they're watching a, a TV program or something, people will pray a prayer or something like that. this. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I put my faith in you. I give you my life. And uh, just, just lead me, Jesus. And they pray that prayer, but they stop there. That's where their relationship ends. Well, if that's where your relationship ends, yes, it will be boring. Because there's so much more to a relationship with God. So many times, someone will pay, pray that prayer, and they don't get baptized. But getting baptized is the next step. Uh, on one of the, the first um, a, a, a sermons to a big crowd of people on the day of Pentecost, they, we call it the birthday of the church. That was the message. Repent. Return away from your sins. Give your life uh, to the Lord and be baptized. That, I mean, like, that, is, that, is, that is the thing. So if you, if you are a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized, please, by all means, get baptized. And how handy is that that there's a class today to prepare you for baptism? What a kowinky dink. That is amazing. And I don't know if we said this earlier, it's in a brand new classroom. It will be the first thing we've ever done. The first ministry is going to happen in that classroom. It's, it's going to become the new, the new nursery after that. But we're going to do the first ministry thing is get people ready to get baptized. Oh my goodness, that is so exciting. What a great first use of that room. Woo! I love it. And that wasn't even part of my notes, but it just felt right. So why is it that sometimes we just don't feel fully alive in God? Maybe you did that. Maybe you sort of prayed a prayer like that, and you just never really took other additional steps with God. Maybe you feel like the connection between you and God is sort of distant, or like God is is just sort of far from you. Or maybe you don't see the connection between your faith in Jesus and your everyday life, but there... He is your life. Like, there is a big connection between God, between Jesus, between the Holy Spirit, and your life. Your, your life, your, when you leave this place, when you go to work, when you go to school, when you go home, there's a big connection. There's supposed to be. And so if you feel aloof, if you feel, feel disconnected, something's not right. We got to get you moving. Maybe you, maybe you enjoy the church for the social aspect, and that is a very valid thing. I look forward to seeing my friends on Sunday mornings. And maybe you look forward to seeing your friends on Sunday mornings too. But if that's all there is to your relationship with God, you are sorely missing out on fully living, fully alive in God. And, and if that's all that, that you put into your relationship with God is just a, a, you know, like an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday mornings uh, enjoying the, your friends, which is valid, but if that's all you put into it, then uh, you may have noticed that when someone says, hey, where are you reading in the Bible? Like on your own. And you, you feel either defensive or like leery, like, oh, uh, I don't know if I'm going to say the right thing or I'm not actually reading the Bible. Or when someone in, invites you to serve on a team or do a project or, or something like that at the church or, or whatever it is, if it's beyond just the, the, the get together with friends, you, you go, uh, maybe you bristle at that. Maybe you go, oh, man, just, that's none of your business. Don't, don't ask me about that. Don't talk to me about that. Well, if that's the way you're living, you're not living fully alive in Christ. Because all of those things, living in community, talking with God all, on your own, all those things are part of a full, vibrant, thriving life with Jesus. And I don't want you to miss out. And I don't want to me, me to miss out. And all of, a, all of a sudden, it got really quiet, which is so funny because most of you are serving on a team. So how about an amen? Okay, okay, good, good. Okay, that's good. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> um, maybe, you, maybe you feel afraid of being vulnerable with God. You know what? There is nothing you can say to, to God that's going to surprise him. There's nothing you can say to God that would shock him because guess what? He already saw you do that. He, he, he already saw. He already knows about it. But he wants you to talk to him about it. Saying a prayer to put your faith in Jesus and just stopping there is like getting your white belt in karate. Not too hard. <laughs> And stopping there, 
when there are so many more belts, so many more levels, so many more things to learn that you, you start learning some of just the moves, some of the basic moves, and then you go on from there and you learn how to interact with somebody else and to be in control of situations. There's, if, if you just stop at a white belt and you never move on to your yellow belt, orange belt, blue belt, uh, if you don't go through the green, the purple, the red, the brown belt levels, if you, if you don't move through the levels then you'll never experience the mastery, the confidence, and the influence that come with, being, with having a black belt in karate. It, it's a big accomplishment. I want you to know you have the opportunity and the invitation to become a black belt Christian. You don't have to stay a white belt. Anybody can do white belt. I mean, you just go down and just buy a white belt. That's how you become a white belt. At, at, there, there may be a little ceremony or something, but you don't really have to do anything. That's the starting point. And that's the way it is when you put your faith in Jesus. It's very important to start. Very, very important. So don't hear me wrong. Like, please, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, do it today before you leave. But just don't stay there. Let's move on. Let's live the full life in Jesus. When, when you are a black belt Christian, you have faith and confidence in God. And nothing shakes that. World news doesn't shake that. Bad news in your family doesn't shake that because my confidence is God. When you're a black belt Christian, man, you, you, you know that Jesus is going to be there. He is going to have your back. When, when you're a black belt Christian, you know that you have a relationship with Jesus that's worth sharing, and you do that. You do share that with, other, with others who don't yet know Jesus. It's a lifelong process, just like it's a long process. Uh, depending on uh, uh, the, the um, uh, organization, it could be like a year for each belt, a, a few months to a year for each belt. So it's many years to become a black belt uh, in karate. But as a Christian, we have our whole lifetime to keep growing and keep experiencing God and keep having renewed life and real hope in him. Here's the thing. God is calling each of us to head for, to be a black belt Christian. But it's going to take some effort. And guess what? You and I we are not going to be able to, to do everything that God wants perfectly on our own. It's impossible. We cannot love every time in every situation on our own. At some point, you're going to catch me in a bad mood. <laughs> some of you may have already. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But we do know someone who did fulfill all God's requirements perfectly. Jesus. And so what we can do is we don't have to strive for, for perfection. What we do is we follow Jesus. And we just do our part to put ourselves in situations where we're going to get closer to him. And we let him work on our lives. We let the Holy Spirit come in, do whatever work he's got to do. Lead us, guide us, correct us, convict us. Whatever he's got to do, he, he's going to do it. And it's his power that we rely on to become a black belt Christian. We do have to put some effort in. You do have to show up. You know, absolutely. It takes some time. It takes some effort. It takes some, some, um, uh, some intentionality. But the power is the Lord's. It is God who makes you fully alive. And that's really good news. I want you to know this, that God loves you as you are right now. You don't have to do anything else to earn God's love. You never had to earn God's love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As uh, Pastor Shelley said earlier, God loved you while you were yet a sinner. So there's nothing you have to do to earn God's love. He already loves you. God loves you. Would you just say, God loves me? That's the truth. That's the truth. We're agreeing with God's word when we say that. And... God does not want to leave you where you're at. He loves you right where you are, and he doesn't want to leave you there. He wants you to be more and more like Jesus. He wants you to have more and more love for God and for each other operating in your life. He wants you to even love, love yourself and not be beating yourself up. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
So God is, God is about love in every situation. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. And it's him who gives you the power to do that. He wants to take you to the next level of thriving in your relationship with him where you're living a rich and passionate, prosperous, fulfilling, abundant life full of the Holy Spirit and all the love, joy, and peace that he brings into your life. So how can you apply this message today? Have you put your faith in Jesus? If not, please start there. This is your day. This is your day to become a Christian. Put your faith in Jesus. Not in your own goodness, not in your own trying, but just simply faith in the work that Jesus did for you. So if you, if you haven't done that yet, I'm going to pray with you in just a moment. Today's your day. Start there. If you've already done that, whether it was recently or years ago, it doesn't matter. If you've not been baptized in water, then how do you apply this message today? Walk, don't run, to the baptism class right after the service and uh, be in that ministry room with the first group, of, first baptism group ever to meet in that classroom. Wow, what a great opportunity. And then uh, next Sunday, I'll see you right down here. Splish, splash, you were taking a bath. <laughs> a spiritual bath, that is. So if you have not been baptized in water, be baptized. Do it. There's no excuse. No excuses. Uh, if there, there, there was one person one time who thought she had an excuse. Uh, I, I, but, but she was saying, I don't want this to be an excuse. And we found a way to baptize her. Actually, there's been a few situations in my life we've baptized in some very, very strange places, but it's important. In the hospital, we just got a bunch of stuff wet. Uh, we put it out a tarp in the, in the front area of the church one time because that's what we had to do because it's important to be baptized. So if you haven't done that, be sure and do that. That is a biggie. For everybody else, Colossians 3, 1 to 4 says this, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, this is what you do. Here's how you apply it. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. So set your sights there. And that word means seek it. Seek the realities of heaven where, where Christ sits at the right hand of, of God. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. So set your sights on heaven. Change your thoughts. Think about heaven, not the things of earth. Why? For you died to this life, and your real life, somebody say real life, your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. In other words, he's coming back for a people who are ready for him, and we're going to go meet him. And he's going to come in glory and honor and majesty and on a cloud and we're going to go meet him there on the cloud. And we will get to share in his glory. It's going to spill over on us. So what are the realities of heaven? Jesus is Lord. And in heaven, you're enveloped in the presence of God. Set your sights on that. Seek that with all your heart where Jesus is your Lord and where you're enveloped in his presence. In heaven, there's no darkness, no sickness, no sin, no pain. Let's set our sights on that. May our lives begin to conform more and more to heaven. May heaven come to earth. May God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the realities of heaven that we're to set our sights on. Set your sight on that. Seek the kingdom of God in your life. Christ is your life, and he is coming back for those who are watching for him. I'm going to be watching Come and watch with me. Why don't you stand to your feet and let's pray. I, I think it, it can be helpful just to close your eyes, kind of shut out distractions, but you don't have to do that when you pray. But I invite you to just close your, close your eyes for now and just be, be with you and God for a minute. Lord, I just want to thank you that as we've been, as we put our faith in you, we are buried with Christ. I thank you, Lord, that we are raised to new life. I thank you, Lord, my old sinful nature is gone. I sometimes act like it's still here, but the truth is it's gone. It's buried with Christ. 
thank you, Jesus, and your church right now, we're just praying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, I'm raised to new life with Christ, hallelujah. So Lord, I just want to pray for all the believers in this room, Lord, that you would make us fully alive in Christ, fully alive, Lord, take us to the next level. If we've been an orange belt, Lord, take us to the next one, Lord God, keep us moving forward, keep us moving forward. Lord, that, that we would be renewed daily, that our minds, our thoughts, our hearts would be renewed daily, that we'd be so overflowing with the life of God that people are drawn to us. They want to be with us. Wow, they see something is different. Lord, be, help make us like that. Make me like that, Lord. I know I've got a ways to go. Lord, come and, and take, take uh, more and more of, of your home in me, Lord. Take, take your residence in me and in us, Lord. How we want your renewed life. We want to be fully alive. And with your head still bowed, I'm wondering if there are some of you who uh, you, you, you haven't put your faith in Jesus yet, really. Or, or maybe you did a long time ago and it was just sort of like you stopped there and got stuck, and today you're coming back online or in the room, I just want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. That's where, how do you do that? Turn away from your sin, turn your life over to Jesus, and let him lead. Turn away from your sin, turn your life over to Jesus, let him lead. Let him be your Lord, just like he is in heaven. If you want to pray that prayer today, put your faith in Jesus, become a Christian, would you just shoot your hand up real quick, boldly? And that will, that will be just a sign to me, Pastor, I'm raising my hand because I want to put my faith in Jesus today. Online, you can raise your hand to God also. I won't be able to see you, but he will. And he's right there in that room with you. The Holy Spirit has been pursuing you. Uh, for some of you in this room, the Holy Spirit is pursuing you, and you've not said yes yet. I just want to encourage you, come experience life. That's it. Just come experience real life. Lord, I thank you so much that so many of us here are we're following you. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here uh, in the sound of my voice or, or watching online that is, has not yet put their faith in you, I pray that right now they would. And they just say a simple prayer asking you to forgive them of their sin and make them new and fill them with your life. Do it, Lord Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God is good. Amen, amen. Take your next step with Jesus. Deal? Take your next step with Jesus. Deal? Deal. Deal. Awesome, good. Great. Speaking of next steps. So as Pastor Garen was mentioning, if, you've, if you are a Christian and you want to take the next step and you have not yet been baptized, please go to the, to the nursery, the new nursery, down this hallway. It's on the right-hand side. It won't take too long. It'll just be a great informational class for you. Also, um, f for those of you who are new to the faith, um, please stop by the following Jesus table out in the lobby. We have a gift for you, a book, and some resources, a free book and a free course on these steps to follow Jesus, baptism being one of them. So let us equip, equip you with that. Let us support you with that. Amen? Awesome. And connect cards, put them in the box in the back, and we will see you next week in person or online. God bless. <laughs>